Hello and welcome to another edition of The English Couple. The English Couple. The English Couple. Which actually, again, isn't there because because it's not going we're in the into studio. yeah. We're in the studio, and unfortunately, that business goes over on the edit suite, and we don't. No, need but it's to... still fun. It's fun. Anyway, you know who we are. Um, and we're in the studio. And today, Julia said, I've got an idea. I've got an idea. I've got an idea for what we could do. I've got a topic we could talk about. Because it's a wet and miserable day, so we're not out and about in wheelbarrows, chopping down trees and that sort of thing. So what are we actually doing then here today, Julia? We're talking about writing. Writing? Yes. What, checks? Writing. <laughs> <laughs> I promised to pay £100,000 in uh, chocolate buttons. Oh, I was going to say to Julia. To but... Julia. Well, <laughs> to Julia, 100,000 chocolate buttons. Chocolate buttons, I'll take that. Yeah. I'll take that. Be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, writing, yes. So um, Writing, so writing books, books poems. Poems. And, and reading. And reading, right? Reading and writing. Reading and writing, writing and reading. So, because one of the things that we do as a couple, I don't know whether you do that, or whether you do that. But, but, but they don't know what yeah, that but, is. But that, no, what I'm saying, well, one of the things that we do do as a couple, and I don't know if they do it, is we read to each other books. We do? Yes, we have a book that we read, you know. Not well, we don't book read that we've cereal packets. No, 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 because <laughs> some people read the paper and, oh, and they say, magazines. oh, look, I've got this article, listen to this. So we re- we're reading a book at the moment. We're reading this one, aren't we? We're reading... Jonathan Strange and Mr Norrell. Is it Mr. Norrell or Mr. Norrell? That's a I say Norrell, you say Norrell. It's funny how even as we switch and you'll be reading and then I'll switch and I'll be reading, we'll just say things differently. It's a bloody great tome. We started this malarkey on the Thames when we were on the Thames boat. I thought you wanted to say that book, but no, the whole reading to each other. Yeah, we were on the Thames and in Ed Sage's boat. The pipe dream. The pipe dream. We were having a lovely time and on board was a number of books and we thought, well, we could read a book whilst we're in the evenings mm. and uh, we found one called Georgiana about Georgiana who was the Duchess of Devonshire in the late 18th century so we started to read that aloud we start and we really quite enjoyed it yeah, yeah it was, and we got we got through it book as well and then I ordered it because we didn't finish it on the trip so I ordered it and uh, we then started to read it at home together. And we mentioned that. I'm sure we've mentioned that in the past. I think we did. So we're now on to this one, which is an even bigger and longer... It's a bigger book, tome, yes. But beautifully written yes. by uh, Susanna Clarke. This one is a fiction. It is but it has elements in it, doesn't it? Of, yes, it's kind of based got, in, in the real world. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it's places. Places and people that were real, uh, but with wrapped They've been up. woven into it. And I know there's been a television ad- adaptation of it some years ago now. Um, but I watched a couple of those and it was all right. But to be honest, the book is so much more interesting as books. It's usually the way. Yeah. So that's, um, I'll put this over somewhere else over there for now. Excellent. Um, yeah, so that was good. So, so but And as it happens, mm. you've actually written a few books yourself, haven't you? I Before I was doing The Bald Explorer and before I got into YouTube in a serious fashion, I'd been doing all my television stuff and it had just sort of come to a fizzling out and I didn't know what to do, but I was creative and had all these stories. Mm. And I've always had stories in my head. Um, and I did start to write children's books. But I think the books that I write for children are not really aimed at children at all. And I think that's why I was failing. Because um, in the end, I realised that ch- the sort of stuff that children were reading was about children, you know, people farting and mud pies and that sort of thing. It wasn't well, really educational stuff. Yeah, really educational stuff. And s- some of them were just sort of, I don't know, I felt a lot of kids' books had been dumbed down in recent times. And in the end, I stopped and then went on to that. So I have got a series of books here which are in different states of... Um, publication it's a nice little wad of books isn't it um, one two three four five six and i just love the whole process of writing i'd get up at five o'clock and i would spend a couple of hours writing <laughs> and i i also it was funny because um you know you always hear writers having writer's block i never had writer's block lucky i could, I could just come up because once you get over the fact that actually when you're writing a first draft it doesn't actually matter at all whether it's good bad or indifferent because you can come back and edit it and change it but so many people feel that they've got to get each line absolutely spot on to begin with. And it's really about the regurgitating the idea as it just comes flowing. And, um, I mean, here's a book, for example, that I'm in the process. You can see all those red. I mean, I print in the end, I got to, this is like third draft. And then I printed it out and then I would go through it. And there was just continual corrections because... 
I'm a crap writer in terms of grammar and things. And, and I would overwrite, you know, I'd, I would explain things like I do verbally too much. Mm. And, and it's about crystallising the thought into the most smallest possible way possible. Mm. Smallest possible way. Chiselling yeah. it down to the perfect carve. So Julia thought it would be quite fun for me to read a few little extracts yes. of that. But tell us about what you've been doing as well. Well, what started this idea for me was that I had a letter yesterday from... The government? <laughs> no. No. From Joseph's Nursery, my youngest's nursery, saying that, they, um, that he'd written a poem. That I'm Joe, sure he, Joe, yes. how old is Three Joe? Three-year-old Joe. He's I'm, written a poem. I'm sure he had a lot of help with it. But he'd written a poem, and um, as part of this... I can't remember what the company is called. Um, but they do um, they do competitions between nurseries... Oh, Young Writers, established 1991. And then they pu- pu- publish it in a book, publish chosen ones in a book. And his has been chosen. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that's really sweet. So you're going to read it yes, out? Yes. Read out. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Three-year-old's poem. Yep. Joseph's first poem. My name is Joseph, and I go to preschool. My best friend is Milo, who is really cool. I watch Paw Patrol on TV. Playing with toys is lots of fun for me. I just love jelly to eat, and sometimes sweets for a treat. Blue is a colour I like a lot. My Paw Patrols are the best present I ever got. My favourite people are Mum and Dad, who are gems. So this, my first poem, is just for them. Joseph Hartley, three. How about that? That's sweet. Um, I'm pretty sure it's only the highlighted words he actually added. I was going to say, he has such a command of the English language at three years old. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, but uh, is, that, um, that is uh, that is remarkable. But it's just a nice little thing to be able to say. Oh yes, he's done a poem. It's in he's a done book. Done a poem. Yeah. My my <laughs> it's son. Published. It's my published. son's poem is better than yours. No, no, yes. But I mean, for some children, that could be the thing that ca- that catalyst. Yes, I agree. Catalyst that, that sets them off to writing more. Yes, I think something. I mean, I mean, when I was talking about these, I felt that I you written. I wrote it on the computer. And it, you know, when you write it on a computer, it's just something you've written and you just look at it and it sort of doesn't look like it's worthy of anything more than that because it's just on a computer. But when you print it up, and I used to send this off to one of these online authoring places um, and they would put it into a book. And when they put it into a book and you get it back and I designed the cover and drew the cover and all that, and you get the sense, oh, this is now like real. It's like a proper thing. And that, so then I would take my red pen in and, and realise that actually the text wasn't as good as I thought it was. And then I would do another draft and, and get that printed. So, um, yeah, so then you get that, you it, building confidence and belief in yourself that actually what you're doing is of some worth. Mm-hmm. So w- tell me about what you've got there. I, however, have yeah. never been published. I've never published myself. Yeah, but, my, my but, stuff has, never, has only been self-published, so it's, yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's not worthy of a, a publisher. <laughs> um, so, but I have got a a book of poems that I wrote. Um, st- started them. Most of them are from when I was fifteen. I'm trying to work out where to put the thing. Um, but a couple of them um, are as recent as 2005. <laughs> 2005. And I don't think I've really written much since. But ever since I was when I was fifteen, I was prolific. 14, 15. I was prolific. I. I I lost so many of them, though. So many of the things. So you're going to give us a, a, a rendition. Read. Give us a rendition of one of one of your poems. <clears throat> and can you remember how old you were on it? Are you well? Date? The date here was well, not the actual, you know, the the specific day date, but it was in 1995. Right. Yeah. So it gives us uh, how old were you in 1995? 14. 14. Here we go. 13, 14. The 14-year-old mind. I was living in uh, Kuwait at the time as well. All oh, right. As you do. As you do. Um, daydreams of Camargue themes. Daydreams I, of what? Camargue. What's Camargue? I'm probably pronouncing it all wrong. It's a place in France. Oh, right. Oh, okay. A breed of horses is named after it because that's where they derive from. Right. Oh, okay. Surprise, surprise. I could just about hear it all around. Silvery hooves thump proudly on the ground. One swish that way, another swish this. Every moment a sight of enchantment and bliss. Their pale bodies a shimmering white, almost like the moon on a cloudless night. The rich cocoa eyes glaring ahead, wide lungs whinny with every step they tread. Their manes wave for for every bounce they make, their tails they swing or otherwise shake, their heads held high, their legs they fling. When all of a sudden, the same old, I should have got a little bell from downstairs, bring, 
spring. <laughs> the end of an exam, another finished day. Home to bed I'll go, or wherever I can stay, to finish off those thoughts I earlier began. Of Camarg horses, into the night they ran. Wow. For Madame Meyer, my French and English teacher, whose exam I was just doing at the time. So I think it's brilliant. You know, there you are, 14, obviously a love of horses, and able to string words together in a sentence that is very poetic well because yeah i assure you all of those words i put together myself yes yes no no but no i i always i just marvel that people can do it you know that's why i love reading because i just think it's it's a, even people who are of a certain age you know a long a much older mature age that they can coagulate their thoughts in such a way as to make it fascinating interesting and um uh, and, and another adjective which I can't immediately bring to mind. One of those. Um, yeah. So and and at such a young age. I mean, I would think I was writing stuff. I'm seriously writing when I was about eighteen, mm. um, because school I found was just dull and very uninspiring. Mm, mm. And I didn't have teachers that would sort of get you to want to do stuff. The last thing I think I wanted to do was write. Mm, mm. But then I was playing with my dad's reel-to-reel tape recorders, recording stuff which in a way is the same process, yeah, yeah. you're still thinking. It's a creative process. Yeah. Yeah. Now that one was literally written, literally. Literally. <laughs> literally written. Literally written. Literally, literal pen, as um, in a piece of literature. After I'd finished a, a test we were doing in my French... A French French test. class, yeah. Ah, which is why you've got a French word and you don't know how to pronounce it. Shush. Um, yeah. She never taught me how to pronounce Camargue. Camargue. I knew that Camargue Is it not Camargue or something? No. Isn't no, that what they do with know. the French? Aye. Are you Breton de the Vallon? Oh, that's Is interesting. Camargue. Because Cam- French don't go Camargue. That, they never have anything. A, a, no, it's probably a really soft G. Oh, soft G, like they're soft cheese. <laughs> may we? Yes, we oh, may. Dear. Why not? We want some. We want more. It's very nice on bread. Yes. You got another one to read? I've got a couple more. Well, I've got quite a few. Actually. She's got a whole book of them, ladies and gentlemen. Stand by your beds. This one was written in 1997. All right. How old were you then? Uh, Two years on, is it? Sixteen. Uh, yeah, yeah. She was sixteen, ladies and gentlemen. With the old, 15, 16. You know, all, in, the, all, the, um, all the emotions of a young 16-year-old going through her veins. 14, 15. But anyway, it was um, second to last year of school. All right, OK. And uh, we, um, I think it was Dust Whom England Bore. Pardon? Um, it was what? Dust? Dust Whom England Bore is a poem that was written in the Second World War, I think, by a soldier. If I, that's why I've... It's a famous poem. Yes. It's not written by you. No, 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 no. No, no, no. But okay. we were given that poem, or we were given a poem each, but that was the poem I was given and told to write a... a, a in the style of? Yeah, well, write in that vein. Yes. Um, so you're going to read it to yeah. us? Yeah, Sailor. It's called what? He's called, it's called Sailor. Sailor. Oh, hello, Sailor. Uh, the tank rattled and rumbled on the very muddy road, took a turn, slipped and tumbled, Water dripped from the metal load, as the mud sucked at the water tank and dragged it down on its trailer. Down it went, down it sank, and with it went poor sailor. Oh. So now he lies, king of horses. Oh gosh, I'm welling up, because he was so brave. But Taylor was one of many courses of his bloody, muddy grave. It's um, about a horse who was a front lines horse taking tanks of water. Oh, the horse was called Sailor? Yeah. I know it wasn't that clear, was it? No, because I was weird. thinking it was a sailor man, as you know. No, 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 I know oh. you were. But that's weird how I got a lump in my throat. Yeah. It's probably because I'm so far removed from that poem. Now? Yeah, yeah when I wrote you not, it. You've not revisited these poems for no, many, no, many no, years? No, not no, for, not for quite some time. Dust Whom England Bore, this is another one I think I did from it. Is that not the same, is that not the poem? I think that actually is. Is that the famous poem? She's not quite sure. No, I'd have to compare it, but I think that might be an, just an d- adapted version of it, just to get my... Oh, right. I don't know. Anyway, so we have another bit of yours. Another bit? We another haven't had any single bit. Oh, let's have a bit of yours then. Uh, so, my, these are books. So, these is, this is, uh, what would you call it, prose? Is it prose? Because it's not a poem. So, it's prose. It's, not, it's hardly literature. But, um, so, let me just tell you a little bit about some of the books. Well, it's the, fiction, for it's sure. It's fiction. Yes, it's all fiction. It's all rubbish. So I started, um, I came up with this book called Splidge the Crag Flinger all years and years and years, years ago when I was in my sort of 20s, I think. And I, 
I remember sitting in a, um, a, a dance studio that um, I was renting at the time after I'd been to mime school and I was renting an office and I had the dance studio to do practice all my mime stuff. I love how you do that when you do mime. All my mime, you know, all of this. You usually sort of, do the wall. Yeah, or... and all that, or pulling something. That's just some signification of mime. You anyway. can't just say the word mime and not No, no, I mime. can't. I just have to, you know, do something. <laughs> and the thing is that um, we were sitting, in, I remember we were sitting in the, uh, there was a bunch of other kids who, were, who used to hang out at this place called Dance Industry in Littlehampton. And uh, Kieran, one of my um, uh, viewers on the show, Kieran Spooner, who writes in occasionally and watches the show, I don't know if he's watching, hello Kieran, um, he's, he was there and a number of other uh, people um, in the little cafe that they had. And I was, you know, I was just scrawling things or coming up with stupid things and I just thought, you know, I'm going to write a simple little story. And I just had a full scat piece of A4, no, that's wrong, isn't it? A piece of A4, can't be full scap and A4 because okay, they're two different things. And I just wrote this title, just came from nowhere, Splidge the Crag Flinger. I had no idea, like so many authors will write something and have no idea what it means, it just sort of pops into your head and you know, write that. And I started writing this very basic story, it was always raining in the land of Gud, it never stopped. And from that became the genesis of a, a book, which then years, many years later, in 2000 and, um, well, when, when was this published? Hang on. I say published. This is actually available in, in 2014. I oh, published this. For Stanley, Georgie and Billy. Yes, I dedicated it. For his three it. children. And uh, it's, uh, it's about 320 odd pages. But I wrote it as a kid's book. And as I said earlier, my stuff is not really suitable for kids because it's too wordy. Yeah. Um, and so this is the story of a young chap in a, in a parallel fantasy world to England. It's like medieval England, but not England as we know it, mm. type thing, um, in which there's, he has a whole load of adventures. So I'm going to read a little bit, but not from this particular one, because in the end it turned into a trilogy. Mm. Um, and so you know what a trilogy is. It's four no, books. Well, yeah, the, the, four the, books. That's not a trilogy. No, three, three books. books. It's four. No, but the beginning of that one, for me, is, is iconic. Is it? it yeah. It's a, well, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's iconic for me. Well, there's a bit... Not the prologue. Not the prologue. The prologue sets up the sort of sinister part of the story. Um, if we can find it. Yeah, here we go. So, this, so the original scribblings is what the basis of this started off. It was always raining in the land of Gud. It never stopped, so umbrellas were essential. One boy who didn't have an umbrella was Splidge. He was dripping wet and soaked to the skin and surprised the city hadn't flooded long ago. Seeking shelter, the boy ducked under an arch of the venerable market hall. The ancient timber-framed building sat on tall stone pillars in the city centre and made a perfect respite from the constant driz drizzle. Anyway, it goes on and it introduces Splidge and numerous other characters. And then... So that, the so first line is very evocative. I think it's always raining in the land. Because I thought what would be the most awkward thing to be to write... You know, if I was making a film, oh, it's always bloody raining, that's going to be a problem. Because that then influences everything about it. You had to have umbrellas and Macintoshes, and even the king was called King Gudamac <laughs> because of a Macintosh. Anyway, so it's called the Royal Tournament because the main character, Splidge, gets inadvertently put in as the royal crag flinger. And a crag is a sort of like mop-like creature that you throw, you grab it by his nose, which is like a handle, and you throw it... Uh, at a crag scoring wall and the crag loves this it's not cruel loves it and he can deflect the currents of the air and try to get a lower score so the idea is that you actually in the tournament you play with other people's crags so it's you're trying to hit the highest score but the the opponent's crag is trying to get the lowest score so, because if, if it was just you and your own crag, so you practice with your own crag and the crag, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So, the, and it's a whole load of shenanigans. It's, it's beautifully wacky and wonderful and it lovely. It is very wacky, very weird. So the second book in the trilogy was called The Purple Death, your Ooh. kind of colour. What yeah, is yeah. The Purple Death and all the rest of it? Well, it's a, it's a whole load of s stories. And again, I tried, to, my drawing was a bit crap, but um, I tried to get the pictures in. So I'm just going to give you an excerpt of this. Uh, towards the end, actually, chapter 13 of it. But it's all very, again, it's, it's in this sort of weird and wacky world. 
Honey and, and and it sort of has a mixture of um, well I said before in English stuff. Honey and lemon, dandelion and burdock, cow parsley and ginger. Old remedies from Culpepper's herbal cures did little to staunch the violent bouts of vomiting that plagued the king that afternoon. Groggins was summoned to the royal bedchamber to bring a hot hot to bring a hot water bottle and extra blankets. Your royal guardiness blurted the royal butler, shocked by the sight of his employer. How many eiderdowns have you wrapped around you? I've lost count. I am cold. The bottle quickly roll it under my feet. Groggins did as he was told. Rubber had yet to be invented, so the, <clears throat> so a hot water bottle consisted of a long, thin ceramic tube with a hefty cork in one end. The king wrapped his toes around the warming device and sighed when the heat penetrated his fat feet. Thank you. Oh, oh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> the piss pot is overflowing. I'm sorry, Groggins, I can't help it. I'm leaking both ends. The elder retainer rolled his eyes, removed a handkerchief and tied it tightly against his nose. Ever so carefully, Groggins lifted the brimming respect, res brimming receptacle and crossed to the window, tipping the yellow liquid out onto the flower bed three floors below. A bell rang forlornly deep within, within the palace, and the king sat up. Oh, that'll be the chief commissionaire. Oh, show him up, there's a good fellow. Groggins nodded, handed the empty chamber pot back to the king and shuffled to the stairs. A quarter of an hour later, Sir Robert Peel walked into the king's private chamber. Charles, the head of the police exclaimed when he saw the state of the Guardian leader. You look like death. I feel it, the king sighed, tugging the bed covers closer to him and sending a flurry of elder flowers, elder feathers, sorry, from a burst scene. Ida. Oh, Ida, oh, yes, sorry, I can't read my own writing. Uh, elder what did I say? Ida feathers from a burst seam. They floated around the two men like a scene on a Christmas card. It's touch and go if I'll survive, said the king. I have the plague. I might expire any minute. Anyway, it goes on. There's these, all these sort of characters. So I, I was a bit like, um, and I hadn't thought of this because I hadn't read this before, but a bit like Jonathan Strange and Mr Norrell using like um, Culpepper and... Um, the, uh, what's his name? I just the, the, Mr. Peel, whatever his name was, uh, just brought in. Um, I was using real people from history, just bringing them into the story because it was sort of this parallel England. Um, so that was that. And then the third one in. I just get to this very quickly. The third one in the series was called the Isle of Gid, which was um, an isle because it all takes place in the world of Gud, in the land of Gud. It was always raining, and in the land of Gud, outside the land of Gud, was the Isle of Gid. You see. <laughs> Uh, and that's where you go to the Giddy Isles. <laughs> there are loads of these sort of nearly, nearly silly jokes. And it's all about pirates and things like that. Um, and uh, I, I, put, I thought I put a thing in here to, to, to read out, but have I? I can't remember. But again, it's all full of corrections and what have you. And I, and I just love the nonsense that you can create. And is there something here? I'll just read this one bit and then... On, and then um, I'm looking for one more piece of Are you looking for one more piece? Here we go. The mayor of Gid liked to think that he was an important man. He was the only one that did, however. He relished, where, he, he relished wearing his heavy gold and ceremonial chains at every opportunity. He never sat down when in company, preferring to strut backwards and forwards as if considering the town's problems from every angle imaginable. Often he would stare out of the window, gazing at children playing in the gutter, wishing that there were merchant ships in the docks to whisk the youngsters away on great adventures, thereby removing the blighters from the streets where they caused a nuisance. John Potterton, the fisherman, sat on a chair in the mayoral office, wringing his hands and shuffling his feet. He still trembled from the night, his night, to Friar's Tally. I tell you, it was like the devil's hound I saw, he began, a moaning and a whining like you've never heard before. Hmm, sounds a bit phony to me, the mayor replied. 
And uh, what about the light you spoke of? John Potterton scrambled to his feet. Ghostly it was. That's the only word for it. Like the spirit of the damned, ready to fly out and take my soul. Did it? the mayor asked. Did it what? Did the spirit of the damned fly out and take your soul? The mayor stopped pacing and leaned heavily on his desk towards the elderly man with the official chain of office jangling like wind chimes. Well, you'll never know whether it did or not, because mm -hmm. uh, that's the only bit I'm going to read out. Unless you go and buy the book. Unless, it, well, the book, that book has <laughs> yet... Not, oh, it's not actually No, been... the first two books are available on Amazon, um, but that one has yet to be published. I think it's still, <laughs> probably still got, it's so big, this one has got 400 and something, nearly 500 pages um, in the final... In the final, they're all ever, ever so good. They're good old fashioned Ooh, ripping. So good. good old they fashioned are. ripping yarns. But mm -hmm. you know, I found I gave up because I spent about five years writing these books, and then I realised there was no money. There was no money in writing. There was no money. All that creativity, and I would get up and I would type and do all these things. There was no money in it, and uh, so then I started to do the YouTube stuff. You're going to read another one of yours. Yeah. This is a short one, this particular one. I've got another one to do after that, though. Excellent. In the old days, at the age of 14, people would be said as courting, whilst nowadays, without a day, without a doubt, we usually say we're going out. <laughs> That's nice, nice well, look, and sweet. I've got this little... Uh, I don't know how I can see that. Probably not real. Two people dancing. Show me here. Oh. Hang on. Two people dancing. Marvellous. Uh, going out. No, going out. Date. Going out. Having a, how can I, I can't seem to get off. Hang on. <laughs> can't switch back. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to switch back, but it won't switch back. Where's the... Uh, hang on, turn that one off. There we go. Um, and then... Where was the other one? Um, I don't know one. Oh, that was in 96, and this one was in 1997. Right. It's called Roll On. Roll On. How's about some fun and laughter for all our hard-worked brains? How's about a bit of space so as we can breathe again? Roll on options, roll on college, encore home time, encore, encore. Let's watch our world go down in flames while we just sit in lesson four. Let's see the teacher pick our brains while we sit watching Third World War. Roll on 2000, roll on uni, encore home time, encore, encore. Excellent, nice, <laughs> uh, jolly one. Yes, isn't it? Well, time is uh, almost against us. Um, I've got two more here, but I won't bother to read extracts from them because it'll take too long, I think. Yeah, but, how uh, long are we done? Oh, we didn't 27 minutes. Really? Yeah, I know. Aww. So I wrote another series of books, which I wanted to do with uh, a, a, another series. So that was the Splidge the Cragflinger uh, trilogy that I was talking about. And I came up with these characters about a bit more up-to-date sort of young kids today, sort of a 12... 13 year old kid called Simon Pickle so I came up with these Simon Pickle mysteries um, so we had and these were sort of ghostly stories murder by ghost house of ghosts and the premise was that Simon Pickle befriends a ghost detective you never quite know in the stories whether the ghost detective himself is a ghost or not and in one of the stories it goes about famous murderers I know it's a bit weird but famous murderers like uh, John George Haig, the acid bath murderer, and they get reincarnated mm. as, as different people. And so the ghost detective is trying to find these people because he, he says that once you're a murderer, always a murderer, unless you can do something to stop them being a murderer in the new thing. So George John Haig was um, executed, he was hanged, when he had been the acid bath murderer but his soul came back basically his ghost came back yeah. and you had to find who it was and prevent him from going down the old tricks and so he travels about in an old white morris traveler um and simon pickle ends up on a school project being inadvertently assigned to him and says so a ripping yarn and so that was the first one and the second one is house of ghosts which basically is on holiday simon pickles on holiday with his mum and the house is full of ghosts and there's a whole weave of story in relation to what that is and the ghost detective happens to turn up he's been assigned to it and again there's that is the ghost detective a ghost himself or whatever very clever 
and the the final one and I've, I've, there are other books but I didn't print them out I've got them on my computer yeah. in in un, like snug and cozy my TV series I wrote a book version of that much more involved highly more entertaining than the kids TV series with loads of sort of twists and wacky ideas but anyway <laughs> so this then there's two books with this one Escape from Snod Hill and I can't remember the name of the other book which again is on my computer but it carries yeah. it goes about these the three characters Wally, Jeffrey and Deirdre Dimple who are orphans at Snod Hill Snod Hill it's over there <laughs> um, and there's Mrs Slimebottom who is the matron of it who they call Whiffy Bum and a whole <laughs> load of you know silly characters and again it's and it what's interesting about this you might not find so interesting is it i've decided that it would be a real place and you follow an adventure where they travel across they build this homemade car and it's based on a pilot that i made for television that never happened so i thought i'll make it into a book so they make this homemade car and they travel from in shropshire um because i happened to have a girlfriend who lived in shropshire at the time i was writing this and they traveled down to lyme regis and uh, which was in the original idea in my TV book, the series thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole load of their adventures anyway. And then the second book, they end up in these uh, miniature um, Spitfires, which fly out from um, the White Cliffs of Dover. Mm -hmm. And a whole load of... I mean, it's just all nonsense. It's all just great adventure stuff. But I love writing. Yeah, it's, and you're good at it. Um, in spite of what you but, think. But nobody, nobody would publish. Nobody, and I sent things. Oh, and my my book that I'd stopped was called Blue Skies and Vapor Trails. Blue Skies and Vapor Trails, based in 1940 England on a farm somewhere in Sussex uh, during the Battle of Britain, and it was about a girl who was again about 12 and her brother and the whole war thing, and I bought a whole load of books and read about the war and got into you know the, the 1940s England quintessential England Englishness and stuff and uh, it's, it's a bit of a tragedy story um, but real again another romping adventure based on all that technology what I loved about all of the books that I wrote is you got rid of technology because hmm. when you can just google something it makes life so easy and, and it's a, a real pain if you're trying to plot a story if the characters can just simply google information or look things up on their phone because it's it just makes it too easy so 1940s there was none of that so if you needed to find stuff you had to go to the library and find a map or talk to the soldiers or get a map and and go where does this go or you just had to go there and explore and it made it much more interesting so i found that life you know writing about the modern day is too easy because of technology and when you watch films, you know how the films, they just say, pull up the map of so-and-so, pull up this. And it's like, oh, it's just so boring. How droll. Yes, how droll. Sorry, anyway, I've gone on a bit there about that. But, uh, yeah, very enthusiastic about that sort of subject. So, yes. Um, what, you're looking at me? Because I was going to say something, but then it just... Poof. It, that happens. It does, it does, it does. So anyway, there we are, writing. Do you writing. do any writing? Do you write things? Do you write poems? Do you write short stories? Do you write to your MP and say you're not happy with things? What do you do? Do you just write checks? You can write us a check. It's very welcome. <laughs> you know, uh, you can write. If you don't like the episode, you can write on the back of a £50 note and tell us everything you didn't like about it. And we'll take note. Well, we'll take that £50 that note. note. Yeah. yeah, that one. I remember what I was going to say. Yeah. I've written you lots of lovely little... You have. I say lovely. Yes. Little uh, she, love notes and she, stuff. She writes me little love there. notes. Might have to, uh, if you've still got them, might have to write some down. Yes. Put them in there. Yes, I've got Safekeeping. To, well, you need a big scrapbook. I mean, you've got about the thousand of them. Oh, don't you want to keep them? Yeah, I'm keeping them. I'm just saying to put them in a big oh, scrapbook. Yeah. Oh, the, you would need the scrapbook then. Yeah, we would need it. We're going to have a domestic <laughs> argument now, so uh, it's time for us to go. Uh, don't forget to put the toys away, close the curtains and make sure you tiptoe up to the bedroom and don't wake Grandad as he's snoring. He's gone to bed early, had a bit of a bad head, you know, it's too much rum and black. So okay. on that note, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's been very nice to uh, indulge you with our fancies and uh, we will talk to you in the future, no doubt. Again soon. Thank you for listening. Toodle Pippin. Bye for now. <laughs>